Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. World-renowned singer-songwriter Buffy St. Marie is releasing information about her past ahead of a scheduled media documentary that is expected to question her Cree ancestry. St. Marie's publicist reached out to APTN News offering the information on Wednesday. Here now with more is Tom Fenario. Hi Dennis. So, CBC is playing its cards close to its chest, but a description of Friday night's upcoming Fifth Estate episode, Making an Icon, reads, an icon's claims to Indigenous ancestry are being called into question by family members and an investigation that included genealogical documentation, historical research, and personal accounts. It appears that Buffy St. Marie wants to get ahead of the story. Here's part of what she has to say in a video posted to her social media today. My growing up mom, who was proud to be part Mi'kmaq, told me many things, including that I was adopted and that I was native. And later in life, as an adult, she also told me some things that I've never shared out of respect for her, that I hate sharing now, including that I may have been born on the wrong side of the blanket. This was her story, and it has never been my place to share it. So. Wrong side of the blanket is an old expression meaning someone who was conceived out of wedlock or as a result of adultery. It is unclear if St. Marie is implying that the woman who raised her, Winifred St. Marie, may in fact be her biological mother. This is a departure from the well-known story that St. Marie was born in Piapot First Nation before being adopted by an American family in 1941. ABTN News has asked for clarification and a publicist working for St. Marie responded, Buffy says her mother told her many things and she does not know for certain which is the case. I also found a new family, a chosen family. And they took me in as an adult in accordance with Cree law and traditions, and they claim me as their own. Now, some of the questions regarding St. Marie's identity stem from a Massachusetts birth certificate for a Beverly Jean Santa Maria, a certified copy of which APTN News has obtained. The birth certificate has the same birth date of Buffy St. Marie, the same given names for Buffy, which are Beverly Jean, as well as the same given names for the parents who raised her. There are also obvious similarities between the family names Santa Maria and St. Marie. In a 2012 biography, Buffy's sisters quoted a saying that the Santa Marias became St. Marie because of anti-Italian prejudice after World War II. A publicist working for St. Marie would not confirm nor deny that the birth certificate belongs to her. Meanwhile, St. Marie's Cree family, who adopted her in 1964, unequivocally support her. A statement from members of the Piapot family says, the accusations which are about to be made of our Auntie Buffy are hurtful, ignorant, colonial, and racist. And we claim her as a member of our family, and all of our family members are from the Piapot First Nation. To us, that holds far more weight than any paper documentation or colonial record keeping ever could. There's a lot more to this story. For all the details, make sure to read the article on aptnnews.ca. I'm Tom Fenario for APTN News in Montreal. Now to that landmark class action settlement for First Nations children and families harmed by the child welfare system that was approved this week. A lawyer involved in it says it will be at least a year before victims see money they are owed. Earlier this week, a federal court judge approved the $23 billion settlement agreement, but victims who have been waiting more than 16 years when a complaint was first launched with the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal will still have to wait a minimum of 12 months before they see any money. David Stearns is a lawyer with the Toronto firm Soto's Class Actions. The earliest that the compensation will flow will be in and around mid to late 2024, and I wish it could be earlier. Uh, you uh, would not believe the amount of work involved in trying to distribute this amount of money to this number of people and do, do it in a way that is, uh, makes sense. A former journalist and Grand Chief in Manitoba is taking another run for National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. Sheila North announced her campaign today in Winnipeg. North is a former Grand Chief of Manitoba, Kuwait Nawi Okimakinak, a journalist and member of the Bunabonabi Cree Nation. At a press conference, she told reporters she has the right qualifications and training for the role. She previously ran for National Chief in 2018 
an election that saw Perry Bellegarde re-elected. If elected, Noor says she will work on building a better relationship between the AFN and chiefs across the country to combat ongoing issues like mental health and addictions in First Nations communities. I think that I, I am ready to lead our organization, but most of all, lead with the chiefs across Canada. I think it's time to take AFN, the Assembly of First Nations, back to the chiefs of Canada because it's their organization. We don't work for AFN. Chiefs don't work for AFN. AFN should work for the chiefs. The other candidates so far are Manitoba Regional Chief Cindy Woodhouse, David Pratt, the Vice Chief of the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations, and Botswana First Nation Chief Dean Sayers. The election is set to take place during an assembly in December. Well, for more on the race for National Chief of the AFN, we're joined by our Truth in Politics panel. Kerry Benjo is the editor of Eagle Feather News, and Negan Sinclair is a columnist with the Winnipeg Free Press. Kerry Negan, great to have you with us. Uh, Kerry, there are now uh, four candidates that we know of, uh, David Pratt from Saskatchewan, Cindy Woodhouse and Sheila North from Manitoba, and Dean Sayers from Ontario. Uh, what do you make of the race so far, and are there any other names you're hearing? I'm, I've been hearing that um, Reg Bel Belrose might throw his name back in. He came in second last round. Um, I'm really, I'm really intrigued with the amount of candidates coming forward. You would think that, you know, with everything that happened last time, people would be a little hesitant to jump into that seat. But there, there seems to be a lot of interest from particularly the prairies. I haven't heard anybody from the from BC yet throw in their name. And um, it'll be interesting to see at the end of the day who all is prepared to take on that um, position. And Negan, you know, um, we're getting pretty close to the, the time when you, uh, the cutoff, I guess, to announce that you're running. Uh, your thoughts on those who have announced and do you think there are any front runners so far? Well, uh, you can't discount uh, Sheila North, who's had lots of support in the past. And of course, if Reg Belrose decides to run, uh, certainly there's support that's still already there. And I think uh, if you really consider the issue with former National Chief uh, Archibald, uh, undoubtedly there was a movement to remove her amongst a segment of chiefs. And who led that movement? It was uh, Cindy Woodhouse, as well as some of the other regional chiefs that were moving in that area. So, so what we've got is we've got kind of a three-person race um, I don't see any other real person coming in and breaking into that in some way. Uh, however, these elections are all about really in the moment at the time. And this is going to be a hybrid format. So you're not going to see the kind of in the past uh, kind of proxies that you'll see uh, during the election. So what you're going to see is you're going to see real people in chiefs voting online as long as, as alongside people who are in live. So, I mean, it, it's the kind of convention that it's really hard to call and it's hard to really predict things at this point. But undoubtedly, if you were to ask me to, to put my bets on, I would say that uh, Sheila North has really got a real shot at it. Gary, what do you see as the, the big issues heading into this December election for AFN National Chief? I think right now we, we, we are seeing a lot of um, talk about cows and plows, treaty rights, and um, the um, situation in, in Ontario with um, the Métis. And um, I think those are issues that are, are going to push a, a lot of um, discussion moving forward with AFM because I think these are discussions that need to happen. Um, and there's so much people within the community that are still so unsure of exactly what is happening. Big things are happening, but at the grassroots level, people still don't know. And they are, look, they are looking to their leadership to figure that out, to figure that out for them. Nigan, it's been a couple, couple of rough years for the Assembly of First Nations. Whoever is elected a, as national chief, what do you think the big challenges facing them will be? Uh, it's the same old issues as always, but I just, relevancy that the AFN really has uh, for years now, and this really isn't just one national chief, this is subsequent national chiefs. 
for a long time, really since I don't know more, that the relevancy of the AFN has really come into question of do we really need an, or a national organization to speak for our First Nations, which have uh, regional interests across the country. Uh, just for example, uh, really whoever amongst this leadership group can appeal to British Columbia, uh, that will be the that will be the person who will come out victorious because the most amount of votes come from that. Area. But if you're to ask me to pick on one issue, um, here is really what I think the national chief will be involved in over the next term. Uh, we have a federal election coming up. Uh, we have the issue in the referendum, really a national referendum on Justin Trudeau's legacy. And will that national chief participate within what has been the most progressive prime minister in history? I'm not saying the best prime minister, but certainly the most progressive when it comes to Indigenous issues. And I think that will be what the national chief will have to deal with because uh, if we see the, a potential next federal government, that next federal government, uh, as well as Justin Trudeau's movement, will be to commodify resources and we know in the past that involves trampling on indigenous and treaty rights and so will the national chief take a place in that car argument. Kerry Negan, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, it'd be great to have the panel on the floor of uh, the election in Ottawa in December but uh, we'll keep an eye on things until then. Thanks. Miigwech. The presidents of three Métis organizations are on Parliament Hill today pushing for the passing of legislation. Details on that after the break. Welcome back. A controversial proposed piece of legislation was studied at a parliamentary committee today. Representatives from the Alberta, Saskatchewan and Metis Ontario, Ontario Métis Nations, Nations were in Ottawa to give testimony. In a press conference on Wednesday, the same rep said Bill C-53 is to recognize them as self-governments for Métis people. However, the chiefs of Ontario have denounced the legislation saying the Métis Nation of Ontario represents alleged Métis communities and if passed will grant Métis rights over lands and resources claimed by First Nations. Liberal MP Jaime Batiste asked for clarification on that point. My understanding of C-53 is this is all about internal governance that's for the Métis and nowhere does it mention land or resources. It doesn't touch issues of land, of you know any kind of ceremonial rights or any of those kinds of things it's it's really the starting point of being able we are self-governing as i said before it's the acknowledgement by the federal government to do you know it's doing the right thing acknowledge that we have that right through legislation and it affects literally no one other than our communities well, the second annual F Cancer concert took place over the weekend with a lineup of some of the best in the business stepping forward to help raise money for kids fighting cancer. APTN's Tina House was there and has this story. Watch out. Do them up. Tonight, it's all about raising money for kids battling cancer. And legendary singer Lee Aaron sang her hit What You Do To My Body to a nearly sold out crowd at the Center for Performing Arts in Vancouver. Rocket Norton has been in the music biz since the 1960s and is the original drummer for the band Prism. Everybody I know has been affected by cancer, either themselves or a loved one, a friend, a family member. And it 
was his idea to put this benefit concert on. Last year, they raised over $340,000, all donated to the BC Cancer Society. This year, all the funds will be given to the Precision Oncology for Young People program. All the musicians are playing for free, uh, playing for nothing. And it, it's, we had 33 musicians last year, we've got 46 this year. And one of those musicians donating their time and talent for the cause is rocker Colin James. I lost my father to cancer, uh, so, uh, but years ago now. Uh, but uh, everyone knows somebody, and it's, uh, it's good to know people are, are working on it and trying to find a, a way to, uh, to help. Jeff Neal, the singer and lead guitar player of the band Streetheart, is also on the bill. I think it's a common cause that we can all get behind. And uh, the friendship that, uh, the, and the long, we've had a lifetime of friendship together that uh, we, we come together to honor each other and our talents and, and, uh, and put on a good night for everyone. And, and we're just so grateful that we've had so many wonderful people that are going to be coming out to the show. And for Rocket, this is personal. I personally been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Um, I started with uh, colon cancer, had the radiation, had the surgeries, chemo, brutal chemo for six months. Um, then the cancer moved. It metastasized uh, into my lungs. So uh, there's no cure for it, there's no um, surgeries or anything they can do. Uh, a year and a half ago, they gave me six months. So um, I, did, um, I did some treatments. Um, I'm, I'm basically treating it now with um, music and love. And once again, F Cancer was a huge success. They raised close to $300,000. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. Time to step aside for one more quick break. Coming up, previews of Nation to Nation and this week's all new APTN Investigates. Stay with us. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. This from the inner east coast of Nunavut. Jennifer Shitoga shared this photo of Whale's Tail Monument from Whale Cove, Nunavut. Great shot. Be sure to send us your pics to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at Friday's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, 14 and partly cloudy in Halifax, showers in 20 for Fredericton. Plus 2 in cloudy in Kujuak, 2 in Nain. 19 with showers in Montreal, 8 with rain in Shibugamu. 18 with rain in Sault Ste. Marie, 16 and showers in North Bay. Plus 3 is the high in Thunder Bay, flurries and 2 in Sioux Lookout, minus 2 with snow in Churchill, zero in Norway House. Plus three with snow in Winnipeg, one below and snow in Dauphin. Minus two in Saskatoon, two below with snow in North Battleford. Minus two in Meadow Lake and La Ronge where snow is expected. In Northern Alberta, minus four with snow for Fort Chip and Fort Mac. Minus two with snow in Edmonton, six below with snow in Lethbridge. Sun's out and eight for Vancouver, nine above with the sun in Victoria. Zero and sunny in Prince George, minus two in Smithers. Minus five with snow in Old Crow, four below for Whitehorse. Minus seven in Yellowknife, one below and flurries in Norman Wells. Snow and minus eight in Saks Harbor, zero with snow in Pulatuck. Minus seven in Chesterfield and Whale Cove, four below in Arviette. Minus 13 with snow in Resolute, 10 below in Arctic Bay. 
We're going to go live to a developing story right now. Leaders and family members are speaking at the Manitoba Legislature following a meeting on searching the landfill there with uh, Premier Wapkinu. And being able to uh, have the pipe lead the way of, uh, of our journey with this government has uh, really touched my heart and and my heart is very light today and uh, the discussions that we had has always been the wishes of, uh, of the family, has been the wishes of Long Plains First Nation as well as the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs. So I'm very, very honoured to, to be a part of, uh, of moving forward and, to, and resetting the relationship that we had with the province. As you all know from previous uh, what has happened and to be able to hear the words of the Premier as well as his ministers in terms of uh, what we need to do and how we can do it. So I'm very, very, uh, very happy to be here today. That's Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs Grand Chief Kathy Merrick speaking there at a press conference that's just getting underway following a meeting on searching the landfill with Premier Wabkanu. You can watch that live over on our APTN News uh, YouTube page. Uh, time now to head to Ottawa. That's where Fraser Needham is standing by with a look at tonight's Nation to Nation. There's big news out of Ottawa this week. Federal court approved a landmark settlement agreement to compensate First Nations children and families discriminated against by a chronically underfunded child welfare system. This historic settlement is an indication of the guilt of Canada, if you will, to perpetuate systemic discrimination in the child welfare system. We'll talk to Cindy Blackstock and get her take on the finalized agreement. We'll also talk to Toronto lawyer David Stearns about another lawsuit to compensate Indigenous kids living off reserve who were also discriminated against by the child welfare system. And McGill professor Veldon Coburn is here to discuss how Indigenous people may have their own unique perspective on the current Mideast crisis. See you soon. Good stuff. Thanks, Fraser. Tomorrow on AP10 Investigates, Brittany Gio goes to the streets of Edmonton and uncovers the number of sex workers who have gone missing or been murdered since the 1970s. One of the people she meets with is Liz Collingbull Taylor. Here's a preview. Liz Collingbull Taylor has experienced the dark side of these streets firsthand. Originally from the Enoch Cree Nation, just outside of Edmonton, her life was beset by trauma and family tragedy from an early age. I think my mother was working to support, as a as a working girl, she was, I think she was, and she got and she got killed that way. My older sister, same thing. She was. Um, she had come with me to the foster home, uh, of my last foster home. So she was there from 11 till she was 16, and then she ran away and she never made it to her 17th birthday. Mary Bella and Valerie Collingbull's murders were quietly mentioned in newspaper articles at the time. She was uh, beat to death and found in a apartment building in the outskirts of Chinatown here in Edmonton. They found a gentleman. Um, he pled down, got 12 years and was out in eight. And that was what my sister's life was worth. So I'm the only female survivor of my biological family. It's going to be an emotional episode. You can catch the full story tomorrow night right here after the news. That is all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Thursday. For much more, including a lot more on the story on Buffy St. Marie, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. And you can head to our YouTube page right now to watch that Search the Landfill press conference happening live. We'll bring you much more on that tomorrow. I'm Dennis Ward from RC. Thanks for being with us. Stick around. Nation to Nation is next. We'll see you back here tomorrow.